But part of it is, of course, coming to the US as a kid who doesn't speak English um, at well, the beginning. Oscar was born in the United States. Sorry, but I'm maybe talking about you. Oh. Um, <laughs> because I'm just trying to work out about your, how, you know, your compassion for this idea about coming into a situation and trying to work out what the rules are. You know, well, what are people saying for a start? Sure. And, quite, and then, well, what are they doing? And why are they doing it? Can, can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Well, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's, it's Ramon, it's a, it's a very good point. Uh, one of the things about uh, being an immigrant or uh, immigrating to a culture when you're old enough to remember certain things, uh, most of us, our primary language acquisition occurs before our memory coheres. So we learn the sort of the deep grammar of the language we use without any memory of remembering it. The deep grammar of our language is actually a commonplace that we don't even see as just an artifact that was acquired. And what happens when you immigrate old enough to remember what would become primary language acquisition and primary cultural acquisition is that you're very aware that these are artifacts that you have to master. These are not things that are just born in you. You just don't suddenly come into awareness and know all the social rules of your society. You actually have to pick these darn things up and you've got to like really master them. There's a grammar to being a, a member of any society. And that grammar tends to be learned and it's usually learned when most of us are so young we don't remember it. And I think that because I learned it when I was very cognizant of it, um, I, I was made very aware that so, social norms as well as linguistic norms and uh, even what we would call epistemic norms, like kind of knowledge norms, uh, these things are learned artifacts. And, um, and that no matter how well you master them, no matter how well I speak English slash well I speak English or how boned up I am in all things American, the very fact that I don't that I have to think about them, that the very fact that they're not actually a commonplace, that, they're, that they weren't acquired mostly at an unconscious level, uh, alters my relationship with them fundamentally. And I think that, I mean, it is a weird thing, guys, that, to, to be speaking and to always hearing um, the echo. I feel like I'm always on a one second delay when I'm talking. The larger part of my brain is always running the language through a filter to make sure I get everything correct. Yeah. Now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, you never stop being an immigrant, I don't think. I mean, my children, if they're born in the U.S., won't be immigrants at all. But uh, I don't think you ever stop. There's this wonderful book. I think the last name of the author is Cahan, Cahan a book called uh, The Rise of David Levinsky. Has anybody ever read that? like the classic of American immigrant literature and you know David Levinsky goes from you know a sort of East European Jew to like a peddler in the Lower East Side and then becomes like a sort of Charles Foster Kane super millionaire and at the end of the book he says this wonderful thing he's like and I have everything I could have ever imagined and I still hate the sound of my voice when I'm ordering food you know you just never stop being that person. And it, I guess it does lead to certain preoccupations and patterns in your characters. You know, I, I think that these things end up being reflected in the people I make without knowing it. But what about a guy who comes from the Dominican Republic and as a kid and learns English and his first novel wins the Pulitzer Prize? But what about him? Well, that's, that's quite something. Yeah, but I mean, guys, I always call that survivor bias. Yeah? <laughs> Well, well, there's, you know, there's this term called survivor bias, which means that usually because we can't speak to the people who came over, all the people who came over, we can't bring every Dominican kid from my cohort and ask them how the experience was. We tend to latch on the one person who makes it and thinks that person is emblematic of the experience. It's my, my grandfather always says that that's, for example, it's like a grenade attack, right? and a grenade lands in the middle of 10 people, kills nine people, one person survives. Survivor bias is us asking the survivor, how did the grenade attack go? You know, survivor bias means that the person who's alive will tell you, it went fine. But it's, it's a deep 
Well, no, it's, it's kind of a mental sleight of hand, you know? They call it a false enthymeme. It's like a false argument. No, but I know? think, but, but I'm really talking about you as the person who arrived, didn't speak English, and won the Pulitzer Prize. Right, and, and I'm thinking of every one of my friends who I came up with who, who didn't. Right, well, let's talk about you now, because mm -hmm. you're okay. here, and they're sure, not. Sure. No, I but I'm talking you. about the, the way you address this, uh, this idea that you've got this one second delay. It's pretty remarkable that you wrote this book in English, and it's so good that everyone thought it was the best book of this year. And, and you still have the sense that you're not quite sure of the next word or whether you're going to sound right in this language. It's, it's a kind of remarkable thing for me, anyway. Really? I always thought it was logical that um, insecurity around an area tends to lead to hyperachievement, among other things. Yeah? I mean, I, I, I've never thought, I, I always thought that one led to the other, you know? It's, <laughs> so in my mind, I think, the, the very fact of winning a Pulitzer or writing a literary text, um, in my context, speaks very much to um, the ambivalence in my experience in acquiring English, you know? Mm. I mean, you, you see kids, man. Kids, when you got little kids around, if they really suck at something, there's either the aversion, right? Or there's the mastery. You know, I just, I went the route of mastery for the language. The experience of reading this book for the reader is kind of like being um, in a place where you don't know the language either. Sometimes there's lots of Spanish there, sometimes you don't translate it, so you just have it there, and sometimes the reader thinks, I think I know what that means. I couldn't actually give you a word-by-word -word translation, but I think I get it. It's like being in a, in a culture where you don't know the language, you think, I know the tune, I'm not sure of the words, but I think I know what this tune is. Sure. Is that what you wanted? You wanted the reader to feel like a migrant in this book? Well, I mean, I just think an immigrant or a migrant, yeah, uh, an immigrant makes, as an immigrant you have certain, you make certain general experiences explicit. What I mean by that is that, uh, look, when all of us are communicating and talking and when we're out in the world, we'll be lucky if we can understand 20% of what people say to us. A whole range of clues, of words, of languages escape us. I mean, we're not perfect, we're not gods. But on top of that, people misspeak. Sometimes you mishear, sometimes you don't have attention. Sometimes people use words you don't know. Sometimes people use languages you don't know. On a daily basis, human beings are very comfortable with what's a large component of communication, which is incomprehensibility, incomprehension. You know, we tend to be comfortable with it. But for an immigrant, it becomes very different. What most of us consider normative incomprehension, an immigrant fears that they're not getting it because of their lack of mastery in the language. And what's a normal component of communication, incomprehension or incomprehensible, you know, whatever the damn word is, um, <laughs> in some ways for an immigrant becomes a source of deep anxiety because you're not sure whether it's just incomprehension or your own failures. My sense of writing a book where there was an enormous amount of language that perhaps everyone doesn't have access to was less to communicate the experience of the immigrant than to communicate the experience that for an immigrant causes much discomfort but that is normative for people, which is that we tend to not understand, not grasp a large part of the language around us. What's funny is, will Ramona accept, you know, incomprehension in our everyday lives, and we will greet that in a book with enormous fury. In other words, what we're comfortable with out in the outside world, we do not want to encounter in our books. So I, I've constantly, people come to me and they ask me, not you of course, but people have asked me, they're like, is this, are you trying to, lock out your, your non-Dominican reader, you know? And I'm like, no, I, I just, I assume any gaps in a story, like any words that people don't understand, whether it's the nerdish stuff, whether it's the elvish, whether it's the character going on about Dungeons and Dragons, whether it's the Dominican Spanish, whether it's 
the, the sort of high level graduate language. I assume if people don't get it, that this is not an attempt for the writer to be aggressive. This is an attempt for the writer to encourage the reader to build community, to go out and ask somebody else. For me, words that you can't understand in a book aren't there to torture or to remind people that they don't know. I always felt that they were to remind people that part of the experience of reading has always been collective. You learn to read with someone else. Yeah, you may currently practice it in a solitary fashion, but reading is a collective enterprise. And what the unintelligible in a book does is to remind you how our whole lives we've always needed someone else to help us with reading. You know, whether it was the first days when we were learning and we had to ask someone what this word meant, or now when we encounter a, ver a verb in Latin that we don't get, and well, some of us don't get, you know? So, I, 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 yeah, I, I think part of me is just, I'm, I'm trying to remind us in the reading experience what is human and what is the origins of the reading experience, which is community. <laughs> yeah, I suddenly sounded really medicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry, you want guys. Some water? <laughs> it won't help, but I will take some. Yeah, guys, I. But you know, this book is about history too. It's about mm -hmm. a lot of things. It's a, it's about many universes, all in. What's wrong with you? I'm sorry. Yeah, the meltdown begins. Go I on, know, Ramon. Your nose I'm so sorry. Is right, right yeah. on the microphone. Please, please. I'm sorry. I've never seen that microphone technique before, but yeah. that's all right. Um. It's about history, and there's a lot of footnotes in this book, um, and they're written uh, with such verve and amusement as well. So you you want to you know you want to sort of several dimensions of the text. Tell me about the footnotes and what got into the footnotes and why. Yeah, no, the, you you again you have these kind of like we were talking earlier. You have these kind of structural challenges for yourself. And one of the things was, among my other concerns for the book, was that this was a book that at its heart had its greatest fear is dictatorship, yeah? Um, one voice speaking only. I mean, that's in some ways what a dictatorship is. You know, if you take the idea of the authoritative to its logical conclusion, you have the dictatorship, yeah? Um, and so the footnotes came out of a strategy that I realized that unless I would have countervailing voices, the book would fall into the very pattern that it was attempting to challenge. The book was attempting to challenge this idea of one person speaking, Sauron Trujillo, this dictator. And therefore, that's why the, it was a book about sort of a new world masculinity, and yet that's why the women were such a huge part of it. Because in some ways I needed those countervailing voices. Because if it would just been all been male voices, it would have just thrown the whole thing off. And the footnotes were part of that like larger strategy. I, again, if you read the book, what you'll see is that the footnotes keep competing with the overtext. You think that the footnotes in standard, the, the standard application of a footnote is to reinforce authority and reinforce erudition. Yeah, that's traditionally the way they're used. These footnotes actually do everything to undermine the story, you know? <laughs> Every chance you think that they're in some ways providing dilation, but they're doing the exact opposite. Every time you're starting to pick up a rhythm in the book, there'll be a footnote, <laughs> you know? And the footnotes are openly incorrect. The narrator <laughs> The narrator in the footnote further on goes, oh yeah, I kind of fucked that last footnote up, but don't you worry. You know, and instead of being erudite and sort of instead of being authoritative, they keep questioning the ability to tell. And, and even worse, the footnotes spend a lot of time delivering gossip and ad hominem attacks. And I, I just wanted that because I wanted people to to sort of the, the, the understory to battle with the overstory in that way that King Lear's clown kind of battled him. Yeah, every time King Lear would get a ball of steam going, the clown would be like, yeah, you know? And I think that that's a really good way of getting at this idea that novels perpetuate in a very subtle way that it's okay to sit down and listen to one unbroken, unchallenged voice. 
I, I always was very fearful that my love of reading novels came out of the same place, and I know this is like a huge leap, but came out of the same place why dictatorships are possible. You know, the thing about collectives and dictatorships is that dictatorships give people a sense that there's an idea of a cohesive, simplifying, persuasive narrative that explains the world. And what is a novel, you know, in the traditional sense, other than a cohesive, simplifying, explanatory narrative? And so I know this is kind of crazy, but it, it was part of that whole strategy. Well, let's talk about the dictator and the dictating is dictatingest dictator that ever dictated, Trujillo. What a strange, what, 30-odd years, 30-something-odd years that that was. And um, the things that went on in that dictatorship, um, uh, um, you know, kind of the, the stuff that novels are made of, I guess. Um, can, can you describe this dictatorship a little bit and what sort of a man this man was and what sort of... Uh, acolytes he, he surrounded himself with? Yeah. Um, the reason I, I was a, kind of interested in this dictatorship is because in some ways it was kind of the, the, uh, the, the essence of the new world. Yeah? Um, if you think about some of the institutions that were the foundational stones of the new world, they were things like the plantation. Yeah? I mean, the new world for the first couple hundred years, its primary institutions were the church, the plantation, and that's probably about it. You know, and so what was interesting about Trujillo was that he was a dictator who was a U.S. trained, U.S. military trained um, a creature of uh, the American occupation of the Dominican Republic in the 20s. He was in some ways the America's man in the Dominican Republic. And he constructed, after he seized power, a very familiar institution across the Dominican Republic. You got to remember that island for a couple of hundred years was the site of probably one of the most horrific human experiments, which was slavery. So for hundreds of years, that country, that island was determined by the selective breeding of human beings and the working them to death, which is kind of an odd thing if you think about it. I mean, beyond just the inhuman abomination that it is, I mean, if you think about an island where for 300 years or plus, people were bred the island of Dr. Moreau style, and nobody gave a shit. And so that was the template for the island's history. It was, and through, what Trujillo did was he reestablished that very familiar story. He created out of the eastern part of the island this old ancient concept of a plantation. He seized the country as its own, as his own. He completely cut it off from the rest of the world. Um, there was no TV, there was no radio, there was no newspapers, there was no foreigners that were permitted in any way to communicate to the population without his knowledge and his, you know, his sort of agreement. And it was such an, it's such a weird thing, you guys, because rarely do you get uh, a return to a very ancient historical model? Um, beyond just the, the human cruelty of it, all the people that were lost, in some ways it was the, the, the sort of the America par excellence. Yeah, and that's one of the, that's one of the major reasons I was fascinated by this because a U.S. trained, U.S. backed, U.S. supported guy, when given all the power, I mean, this guy was so goddamn wealthy that the Dominican Republic is a tiny isle that almost no one in the world can discover. It's part of a tiny island no one in the world can identify. This guy had bomber wings. He could have wiped out the entire state of Florida. I mean, he had so much stuff. But what he chose to do with this enormous privilege was to create, in some ways, what was most most American, which was this total, totalizing, fascistic thing called the plantation. And, um, and I thought that that was a, not a bad, bad, dark lord to tackle in a novel. I felt like it implicated the Americas in a very interesting way. It talked about sort of the secret history of the New World, and the secret history of the New World is, of course, the extermination and the breeding of people, which we don't like to think about, yeah? I mean, when the average person thinks America, they don't think 300 years of selective breeding. 
and then the working to death of the failed portions of that breeding. You know, we tend not to think of probably, if you think about it logically, two or three miles of skeletons. Yeah? I mean, in some ways, the Americas is a haunted house. And uh, I just felt that he was a perfect, perfect connection and a perfect person to tackle. And in a way, doing it where, you know, I mean, guys, when you fuck with monsters like this, if you don't crack jokes, you're going to lose your humanity. And I, you had to figure out a way to tackle what I would think the new world is and still maintain your humanity, which is by, by what I mean by that is a full range of emotion. And his acolytes and his, his supporters offering up their daughters to him. Mm. Um, uh, and you know, he, he was ravenous for young women, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Well, no, because if you think about it, that's the right of the, the head of the plantation is to you know, rape whoever is in his domain. But look, guys, I mean, it's so easy just to be like, oh, this is such a horrifying thing. We have softer forms of this. I mean, we gladly offer up our children to people who are extremely wealthy and powerful because we think that that's very attractive and normative, not in such an explicit and horrific way as Trujillo's uh, minions offered up their daughters. But I do think that... The, Power, no matter what country we're talking about, um, accrues to itself an enormous amount of privileges that those of us who live in the country don't, aren't always completely aware. Yeah. What about this sartorial methodology of uh, uh, looking for targets and, and uh, killing people according to uh, whether they were stylish or not? Oh, come on now. Tell yeah. me about that. No, no, this was just a particular, uh, this was just a particular individual obsession. All this nonsense I was talking about before, you know, that was the global, but Trujillo was obsessed with clothes. Yeah, like most dictators, they love medals and they love uniforms, but he took it a step further uh, where he, uh, you know, the first sign that you knew that you were in trouble was a, a, a unsigned criticism of your dressing of your dressing style or of a pair of shoes would appear in the newspapers. So somebody would be like, oh, you and you, he had terrible shoes on that night. And that was the first sign this guy was gonna eliminate you. It was really weird, you know? I think he just, again, he, the Marines uh, during that time in the 20s, they would have every day, they would check your, uh, I don't know what it was called, like comportment. And uh, they, you know, you would get your uniform checked and uh, the Marines kept actually meticulous records in the 20s and 30s, not so much of whether you drunk or fired, you got drunk and fired your rifle, but how neat your uniform was. And he kind of took this uh, we could bureaucratic obsession and inflicted it on the whole country. Yeah, you, if you're really bored, you can find Trujillo's report card of his dress style in Marine headquarters in the US. It's kind of fucking nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Ramona, thank you so much. And thank you so much. <laughs>